when it comes to physical limitations, my specialty really is sensory integration, kind of looks at more developmental. Once you think of physical limitations, it's more physical rehab, and we do have a whole section of Texas Neuro Rehab Center dedicated to that, and we have OTs that specialize more in that. Um, what I want you all to do right now is stand up, actually, because we're going to dance. Come on, I want to see the head seem to be moving, arms up in the air, <laughs> hips. Come on, everybody. Mm -mm. I'm mic'd up, so if I can do it. Arms up, important. Head, turn the head. <laughs> Have a seat. So if, before we get started, what are you noticing in your bodies right now? Anxiety. Anxiety. So how do you, how do you feel that in your body? What are you noticing? Uh, heart rate. Heart rate is what? Heart rate increases. Heart rate increased. What else? You feel, how do you know you feel good? What are you noticing in your body? Relaxed. Okay, so you feel relaxed and she's moving her shoulders. What else? What did y'all notice? At first I felt embarrassed. Embarrassed, but how does that feel like in your body? See, it's different. We have all these emotions, all these, all these cognitive things, but in your body, what did embarrassed feel like? A little tight. A little tight. Anywhere in particular. You did this, so where in particular? This area or where? Maybe the shoulders. Maybe the shoulders. Anybody else felt, what do you, heat in your head. Okay, so heat in her head. How about breath? Mine's up a little bit. Anything else? Hypervigilance. I was looking for the exit. You were looking for the exit. So he was really looking around, so a little PTSD going, it's okay. I work with that. Um, actually, there's a technique for that. I can, that I, anyways. So let me introduce myself a little bit more. So again, and I can maybe hear some of you can actually say Tere. Most people in Austin can, so I go by Terry. But so uh, I've been at Texas Neuro Rehab Center for 31 years. So it's actually been there a long time, which is I'm really proud of that. Um, and like she said, I primarily work with children and adolescents that have neuropsychiatric issues. Um, but then I also have the pleasure of working with adults with chemical dependency, and I do stress reduction with that. And the beauty of that is that. Well, I get to work with kids and adults, so it's kind of nice that I can talk more with the adults and do more of my playing things with the kids. Um, but hopefully, as, you, as I go through this, you'll see that I can kind of blend the two because I'm still talking about the same brain. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about today, hopefully in a fun way, to really understand more about the brain. Um, so my goals for you are this. My goal is that you have, a, by the time you leave here, that you have an increased appreciation of our amazing brain, and especially how our brain processes sensory information, and how we do this thing called sensory processing, uh, usually without effort, and how it just happens automatically, but I want you to have an appreciation of that, and how it works beautifully in most of us. Um, I want you to also then recognize when it's not working, to kind of recognize when some kiddos or adults are having, and I am gonna use the word kids, that's just easier, say so children, adolescents, um, when they, have, when they have deficits, to kind of understand a better sense of that and the implications for that. Um, I also want you leaving with an awareness of sensory preferences, not just sensory problems, but sensory preferences. And since I've been giving the luxury of having two whole hours, we're actually gonna ex explore that because it's important that you know your sensory preferences and that you know your client's sensory preferences because sometimes that's the way to reach them. You don't have to have sensory issues to use sensory strategies, and part of that is understanding your own sensory preferences and the sensory preferences of the kids and also many of the family members because you might have a family where one kid loves lots of activity and then you have a mom that, that really is more sensitive and likes things more quiet and them understanding that those two preferences are maybe clashing could be another avenue of having them do better communication in the family, for example, okay? Um, 
And then, hopefully at the end, we'll spend a good half an hour at least talking about coping strategies, so century-based coping strategies that you can apply. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you are professional working with kids, and if there's any families here, hopefully you can apply that to your, to your children as well. Uh, but strategies that you can apply, and again, to a lot of populations, not just individuals with century issues. Okay, does it sound like a good deal? So let's just reflect on this, because for most of us, sometimes we don't give ourselves credit that we actually are here for a very special reason. But I, I found that quote a long time ago, and I've kept it, and I have it in my office. And I have, oh, this is Dahlia. She's, she's my Vanna White today. So she's my intern, and she's going to help me when we pass out. We're going to be doing some experiential things. So. So sensory integration is what we're going to start talking about. So what is sensory integration? And the reason I have this definition here is because I wanted to quote Jean Ayers, because for the OTs, uh, Jean Ayers was the guru. She's the one that actually started defining sensory integration and identifying and seeing how, for some kids, sensory integration was not working, was not happening. Uh, and so I, I always want to have that, too, because she's the one that actually started researching. Uh, especially, she started off with kids that had more like learning disabilities. So again, what we're going to be talking a lot today is how our wonderful brains take in information from all these senses, processes, process it so we can adapt and learn and do everything that we do at all. So the foundation of all of it is how we process sensations and how we use them, usually on a very automatic level. Okay. And so we're going to be talking about, and I'm really excited because normally we talk about five senses that we know about. Two that you might be less familiar with, but now there's an eighth one that I was aware of, but it isn't until this year, even me with 31 years experience, I'm going to be talking a lot more about a new, not, not new because it's been around, but one that's being studied more because I just got this amazing book called Interoception. So we're going to be talking about this other sense that especially who in here works with kids on the spectrum, with kids with autism, huge, 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 I mean like, I'm like, oh my God, like I kind of knew it, but now I really like know it, so we're gonna talk about that. So we're gonna talk about the, what are the five senses to begin with that we're most familiar with? What are the five senses that we're most familiar with? Is this, hearing, vision, what were we using when we were dancing? So we were, we were listening to the music, what else? Wait, but see, he's got the fancy word already. He must be in the doctorate program probably, right? So yeah, we're going to talk about vestibular. So we're going to talk about this sense called vestibular. But what else were you all noticing when you were moving? Did you notice like maybe wind going across your skin a little bit as you were dancing, right? And did you, are you noticing people dancing around you and me in this beautiful dress? Don't you like that? <laughs> so you have the vision sense kind of working and seeing me dance and hopefully I was role modeling good dancing. So a lot of the sensory systems that you were using, uh, that's one of the reasons that got you all moving is to, to explore that, but also to get you moving and awake so you can pay attention to my wonderful words, right? Um, so let's explore these other senses. So the basic ones, of course, we know it's you know, sight, listening, smell, taste. Um, and then touch, but we're going to talk about these more important senses. So he talked about the vestibular system, okay? So the vestibular system is my favorite, actually, except the interoception is kind of getting in there. So the vestibular system, we use it all the time. For example, <clears throat> pretend you were bored now with me. I know you're not, but pretend you were bored. What would you start doing with your body? And that's why I had you all get up. What do you start doing very subtly Actually not, because you don't want to relax. You want to be able to be more alert. So if, you say, if I'm boring, you're going to start relaxing too much, and so you are going to start wiggling, and, and right? Now, the kids we work with are not so subtle, right? They, 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 they don't have the social skills yet, or they, their sensory systems don't work the same. But that movement, that little bit of movement, helps with arousal and alertness. So that's the, at the bottom, but that's one of the main things that we use it for. But we know that the vestibular system, a lot of us know we have those inner ear canals and we have these other systems to help us with our balance and equilibrium reactions. And it also gives us information about where we're moving. Are we going fast? Are we going slow? Are we going right? Are we going left? Am I upside down? Am I right side up? So it gives me information about where I am in space. So it's kind of like my GP. I used to say it was like the place on the map, but it's actually like your GPS center. Um, it also gives you um, muscle tone. So muscle tone is the ability, for example, for you all to sit there and not slouch too much. And how many kids do you work with that this is their muscle tone? They're like, they're like, like this. Or, or, or if you see them, this is the way they present. Right? And this is the posture, literally. Or sometimes you'll get this. 
It's because they don't have a nice core. And, and, it's, and it is, it's kind of funny, but you know what? It takes energy for them all day long to just sit upright or stand upright. So they have to lean on things. So that's energy that's being expended to do that instead of energy that they can use to pay attention to the teacher and to, and to focus on what's being said and to understand what's going on because they're having to adjust their bodies. So even that little bit of muscle tone can be a big difference. It also affects their motor coordination. So they're gonna have a harder time, let's say, with handwriting and things like that, and even reading because you have to have good muscle. So a lot of these kids have problems with ocular motor or how they use their eyes because it's the core of your body that's nice and stable that then our eyes move around to, to help you see and understand the world around you and see better, not acuity-wise, but how you move your eyes in space to gather the information. So it affects all of that, and that's just one little thing of the system. Gravity, which I keep meaning to move to the bottom because I always talk about it less, it's something we take for granted. And when we wake up in the morning, we don't have to think about, okay, am I still connected to the earth or am I gonna float off today? Or was that yesterday? When we go up and down stairs, we don't have to like, is it gonna be there? How far is it down? Because I work with kids and I have a little bit of that. I have some sensory integration problems myself. So that was, I was guided to this. And when I went to school, I'm like, oh my God, I should have had this therapy like for myself, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. Um, but anyways, gravity, we take it for granted, as we should. But when we have kids that do not get gravity information, that means they never feel grounded. They never feel anchored. They never feel like, here I am. So when you're born, people say, well, your first connection is to mom. When you're born, your first connection is to Mother Earth to go, here I am, and to kind of know your place in the world physically is through your gravity centers. And if you are born not processing that correctly or later on develop that, but usually it's something that you're born with, you go around literally never feeling grounded. And so to me, from what I've seen and my understanding of it, but what I've seen through my years of experience, these kids, and it's not the only reason, but they're never emotionally grounded either. Because they don't start off with their bodies knowing where they are in space and here I am. So it's a huge, huge thing when you have gravity issues. So the vestibular sense is a really, really important one. And then proprioception, the best way to explore that is to have you all close your eyes. And I'm watching you, so if your eyes are closed, I can see you. My eyes are open. <laughs> Lift a hand, point a finger, and do a signature. Like, do your name. And I always like to see how many people keep their hand up or how many people bring it down afterward. And how people have the huge names that keep going and going. How did you know that your hand was up and not your knee, for example? And when I said point a finger, nobody pointed an elbow or pointed their butt out or pointed their ear. So how did you know it was your finger that was out? And when you had to do a signature, how many of you ha had to think, OK, how does T go again? OK, yeah, I have to do a downward stroke and then go across. Because I have kids that for them to write, they have to do that. Because they're, they're not getting on a regular basis even basic letters. They have to think about it. So how did you know? How did you know it was your hand up? Hmm? How? From what? Because it wasn't touch. It wasn't smelling it or tasting it or seeing it. So what is? It's not experience. It, it comes, you develop experience out of using this sensory system. I felt it in my shoulder. Yes. So shoulder, all these muscles, all these muscles, it's muscle and joint information. Okay. So every time you move a muscle and joint, you're getting proprioceptive input. That's what lets you know also where you are in space, and that's what lets you know how to coordinate to do stuff so that we don't have to think about how to tie our shoes. Right? For example, we don't even need to think about how to drive anymore. And you know how complicated driving is? How many of you get someplace and you're like, I'm, how did I even get here? It became so automatic. And it's a very, 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 if I break it down, very complex task. has to do with proprioception. However, if you get into a brand new car, or a rental car, and it takes a while to adjust to the brake because it's maybe a little bit faster than yours, right? You have to adjust to that, but pretty soon you do. Well, imagine that happening with everything. Well, you have to, every time you have to do something with your muscles, it doesn't, you, it's not an automatic thing that you know exactly. And so it affects a lot force modulation. So when you're having to adjust to a brake pedal, or when you lift a suitcase and it was actually heavier or lighter than you thought and it kind of throws you off, that's force modulation. We're working with an autistic uh, young man right now. He's nonverbal. Huge kid. Um, he's going through a lot of grief. His mom just passed away. And so that's one of the reasons we're seeing him, because he, his behavior's got a lot worse after that. 
But one of the things that I think is going to get him in trouble, because he's really big for his age, he doesn't modulate force. He has no sense of that. So he's very rough with everything, to the point that he can hurt people with his roughness. And to the point that when, he, when he's done with something, he can't communicate. Like the other day, I was trying a battery-operated toothbrush to see if, because he's sensitive in his mouth, and we'll talk more about that. And, after he, and he kind of liked it because he kind of stayed with it. But when he was done, he just broke it. And I think it just had to do with, like, I'm done. And, 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 and it was like, I don't think he meant to break it. I don't think he knows the strength that he's got. Uh, after many, many prompts, he got into this ball pit that we've got. Because he kept pointing to it, but then he was, he's, he has a lot of gravity issues, so he couldn't figure out, you know, he was trying to figure out how to get in it. And finally, once he got in, balls were everywhere. I mean, he just, he was so excited, but he didn't realize the force with which he was playing with those balls and how they went everywhere. So lots of problems with force modulation. But it affects even simple things that they are not so simple, like how hard you write. So I have a lot of kids that break pencils. Or when I, when they, when I do testing with them, I can see that you can, they almost break through the, through the paper because they, they do it so hard because they can't adjust the force. So a really big important sense that we use all the time. So anytime you move and you're moving muscles and joints, proprioception. This is also going to be a really important sense for um, when we talk about strategies because it helps with almost everything. So I was telling her on the way here even, because was, I was asking her some questions. She's like, I don't know. She's like, remember what I said? If you don't know what to use, what can you always use? Proprioception, and it's going to work for almost everything. So it, we'll talk a lot about it later when we talk about coping strategies. And I'm really excited about this, because this is not a new sense, but it's a new one that they're doing research on, a new one that we're seeing, oh my gosh, this is really maybe going to be impacting a lot of our I work with a, kid, a lot of kids that are not on the spectrum, and I, I can see lots of kids that this, this is affecting, but especially kids on the spectrum. So interoception is a sense from the inside. That's why I was asking you all, well, what do you notice on the inside? What are you noticing? What is it that you're noticing? How do you know it in your body? Because that is interoception. So interoception, and let me get to this, because I want to make sure, because I, I, it's kind of new for me. I'm going to read from this a little bit, but it helps you with all this stuff. Look at all that stuff. We take that for granted. How many autistic kids do you work with that do not know when they have to go to the bathroom? By the time they go, it's too late. How many kids have a hard time going to bed because they don't know when they're sleepy or not, when they're full or not? Right? But it's not just that. This is so important for you to know how you're feeling inside. How do you know when you're anxious? We know when we're anxious. We've been reading that in our body through body singles all along. But what if we have all these kids that are not really reading when they're getting mad until it's really big and they're at, at that point it is, they're out of control or they don't know how anxious they are until it's really bad because they're not picking up those body signals from the inside of the body. I do something called somatic experiencing. Anybody familiar with that work for trauma? Anybody? Okay. But somatic experience, I'm not going to go into it. I am, if anybody, anybody works here, I'm going to come back for like another hour just to talk about that. It's, it's, a, it's an, another intervention for trauma that I'm getting trained in. And a lot of that is about checking in with the body. It's, it's working through trauma, not cognitively, but through the body, thinking that trauma is actually how your nervous system responded to the situation, not, not emotionally, but how it's in the nervous system. Um, but look at all this stuff. And that social touch. Anybody familiar with the polyvagal theory? There's a new theory also about the vagus nerve and how it actually, we realize now that briefly that there's another branch of the vagus nerve that actually gives us information about social engagement and that that's an important part of survival. It's just as important as fight or flight is that ability to socially engage, which is one of the reasons that therapy can work because you're socially engaging with the kids and it's another way for them to calm their nervous system down when they're too much in the fight or flight. So that, that social touch is part of that. And for some of these kids, they're not getting that. They, they get over aroused. Like this young man that we work with, he's very sensitive to touch. He loves to play with touch, but he's not socially. It's hard to engage him with touch because he doesn't get it. And he has really, really poor boundaries. I'm sure you have a lot of kids with a lot of poor boundaries. 